thank those of you who are here and those of you who are online who are uh, coming to this inaugural lecture of what is meant to be a set of six exploring a subject that scientists tend to uh, avoid, that is thinking about the wider implications of what they're doing. However, my attention was especially focused on that sort of issue uh, with the Templeton Award. And that award included this um, phrase, or this, this was the inspiration of, of the Templeton Prize in general, which is harnessing the power of the sciences to explore the deepest questions of the universe and humankind's place and purpose within it. Now, very few people would dispute that science explores the deepest questions of the universe, or at least of the physical universe. But many people would and did and, and do dispute the, question, the issue of whether science can say things about uh, humankind's place and purpose within it. But I'm going to show you a way that I think uh, makes it very clear that science has a very uh, profound role to play in exactly those questions. The great philosopher David Hume was perhaps the most uh, uh, renowned and incisive critic of the idea that science had anything to say about uh, morality or purpose. His arguments were so strong that they became known as Hume's guillotine or the uh, science morality uh, distinction or uh, the impossibility of going from is to ought. Things. He argued and I think it's hard to dispute that no number of statements and no reasoning based on statements about what is can lead you, just as a matter of grammar, really, to statements about what ought to be. There's a world of facts, a world of values, and there's a divide in between them. Hume's guillotine, it became known as, uh, that shows you cannot connect the two. Well, I'm gonna stick my neck out and argue that there's a way around this guillotine that's very meaningful, that does not allow you directly to connect is to ought, which is grammatically and logically uh, very difficult, probably impossible, but can enrich the discussion of the, and give a way around the the the, um, the impenetrable impenetrable divide, the abyss between questions of is and ought. And my way around that will be talking about uh, thinking about the future, thinking about how one goes from questions of is to making deductions about what could be, and then from imagining what could be to look at the menu and uh, knowing what the menu is, make informed decisions about what should be, and then from should be to is, once you know where you're going, at least you have a better chance of getting there. This is a very human endeavor, literally. It's something that most of our brain is devoted to. Most of our brain, the gigantic uh, frontal lobes and uh, uh, cortex are involved in planning and imagining the future, uh, especially this frontal, this 
frontal area uh, where imagination and uh, the uh, planning and making of exec what's called executive functions reside. And you see that that's what humans are especially good at. And that makes sense because thinking about what could be and what should be to get to what you should be doing, what, it, what you'd like to, what, what is, and making it what is, is a very challenging thing. It's not only taking the world as it is, or what a straightforward analysis of uh, what's gonna happen in the immediate future, it's imagining very different alternatives and weighing them. And just as it's much easier to read a foreign language than to, to produce it, to speak it, uh, it's much more challenging to imagine different realities than uh, to uh, react to them. And that's why our brains are as big as they are <laughs> compared to other animals. Einstein said this more concisely, imagination is more important than knowledge. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to be talking about futures, which is the way to implement this uh, triangle, this threefold way. Now, I'm not going to be involved in the business of predicting futures. As the famous philosopher and bad ball hitter Yogi Berra said, it's very tough to make predictions, especially about the future. There he was anticipating uh, modern trends in chaos theory and quantum mechanics that show fundamental limitations on our ability to uh, predict the future as well as just the sheer number and complexity of interacting parts that the universe presents to us. But what you can do is imagine and sketch out different possibilities, and that's what we'll be doing. So let's begin by working on the first arrow, the uh, going from what is to what could be. In the, the three lectures that come after this one, I will be going into considerable depth on where science is, where it's going, and where it could go in the long-term future uh, in three different areas, in the understanding and using of matter, in the understanding and using of life, and in the understanding and using of mind. But I, here I'd like to give you a, a little sampling of where we're gonna go with that. And already in 1928, the great physicist Paul Dirac, plush with the success of quantum mechanics and his contribution, quantum electrodynamics, in explaining so much at a profound level about the foundations of chemistry and a wide variety of physical behaviors, uh, said that the laws necessary for mathematical treatment of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And the difficulty lies only in the fact that the equation that the, these laws lead to equations that are too complex to be solved. That bold statement, now almost a century old, has held up and only been strengthened by subsequent uh, developments. We've understood not only the electrodynamic forces that hold atoms together, but also uh, the nature of the forces that hold the nucleus together. And um, so far, uh, and and uh, even even so-called weak interactions, which are uh, something that were discovered in the 20th century and weren't understood at the time of Dirac statement, all that has been understood very profoundly and is encapsulated in the so-called standard model. So 
Dirac was, I wouldn't say too conservative, but uh, he, he nailed it. He, he, this, was, this statement holds up very, very well uh, today. The thing that's changed, the most notable thing that's changed is that we've gotten much better at solving the equations. Uh, with the help of our silicon friends, not only, not well, first of all, using the human brains and their cleverness, but also enhanced with the power of silicon friends, which were designed using quantum mechanics by human brains, uh, we can do a much better job of solving the equations. So there's a kind of positive feedback loop where better. So uh, better uh, methods allow us to build better machines, which allow us to make better methods. The first of many positive feedback loops we'll be talking about in these lectures. Uh, I will save the bulk of the discussion of uh, matter as uh, and how uh, the, the frontiers of matter and how uh, they're expanding uh, for the second lecture. But I'd like to give at least just one application, which is uh, especially interesting besides the computer uh, and has obvious social, sociological and uh, moral implications for the future. That's the development of efficient methods for converting light and electricity into energy, uh, I'm sorry, converting light into electricity and electric, especially a particular electric energy, which can then be changed into many other forms of energy. Uh, as you know, uh, we've so far been relying in our industrial civilization on carbon fuels, which are uh, sunlight captured by plants many millions of years ago and uh, stored underground, but that's, first of all, a resource that can't be renewed easily, and secondly, one that uh, is poisoning the atmosphere. We can use the sun more directly now by having materials that uh, take the energy of light and convert it into electrical energy, which is much easier to work with. This would not have been this development which is changing the world, and as you can see, and you see these uh, farms that exploit the sun's light, so it takes the sun's energy and turns it into things that we can use more easily, uh, sprouting up all over the place, including on people's roofs, uh, and Arizona is especially a good place for it. This comes from a very sophisticated understanding of quantum mechanics, would be literally inconceivable without it. In fact, it's the heart of this development is the production by an incoming photon of an excited electron that carries energy and separate from it and moving in the opposite direction, a hole, a positively charged kind of antiparticle of the electron that, uh, that then separates. So this would have been literally, as I said, inconceivable without quantum theory, and yet now it's changing the world. Mm -hmm. Still, our ability to solve the equations and fulfill Dirac's vision uh, of putting chemists out of business in a practical sense uh, is limited, but new kinds of computers, so-called quantum computers, promise to be very good at doing quantum mechanics and solving the equations of quantum mechanics. And so we can look forward to big progress on fulfilling that vision, which will ramify throughout material science, medicine, and other domains. Turning from matter to life, people have learned that life is very much a physical phenomenon. We've understood metabolism, heredity uh, at the molecular level. 
And we're beginning to learn how to uh, manipulate heredity. In fact, there have been big leaps recently in the ability to reprogram uh, creatures ranging from bacteria all the way up potentially to humans uh, by tinkering with their genetic messages efficiently using a technique called CRISPR. Uh, this is Jennifer Dudna, one of the developments of this CRISPR technique, who uh, gets pretty cocky sometimes <laughs> and said, uh, it is a tremendously powerful tool. This is the molecule that uh, does the job, does the hard work of the, um, this is the, of, of, of the genetic engineering, taking one thing out and putting a substitute message that you want in and said, uh, let your imagination run free. What problems do you want to solve first? Well, I don't know first, but here's the problem that I see as the biggest problem that leads into the discussion of mind. How does this get made? Well, first of all, what is this? This is a slice, a very thin slice, of the hippocampus of a cat. Uh, and then uh, stained with something called the Golgi method that stains about one in a thousand cells selectively, one in a thousand uh, totally, and leaves the rest alone. Uh, and using that technique of thin slicing and uh, selective uh, dyeing allowed the great neurophysiologist Raymond Cajal at the beginning of the 20th century, in the early parts of the 20th century, to be able to make pictures like this of what the nervous system, or this important element of the uh, nervous system of a cat looks like. Let me remind you that this is an extremely thin slice and you get only one in a thousand cells. So it's actually much more complicated than this, but you can see already from this picture that there's a regular architecture, that there's a lot of complexity and this perhaps makes it plausible that mind can emerge from matter, which will, is a, so-called astonishing hypothesis that we'll discuss at, at length in the fifth lecture. In any case, for a biologist, the question is how does this get made and how does it work? Leading into the frontiers of mind, of course, that's one kind of mind is the human brain. Another kind of thing that I think deserves to be called mind are uh, the computers we have today. Those of you who've played with chat GPT, for instance, or uh, tried to beat your computer at chess, know that they can be very formidable intellects in a sense. Uh, then we have new kinds of minds on the horizon the quantum computers, but a remarkable development of recent years is that a kind of computer architecture inspired directly by the kinds of uh, nervous systems you saw in the previous diagram, uh, diagram so so-called neural nets, where these are not actual uh, neurons, not actual nerve cells, but artificial entities that uh, uh, mathematically implement in a very simplified way uh, the operation of neurons, it's been found that that architecture is actually very, very powerful at doing some of the things that computers were very poor at before, like identifying cats in pictures uh, that we don't know. We do that, but we don't know how we do it. And apparently this is a big part of the answer of how it's done that these neural nets uh, can be trained by um, specific algorithms to do these kinds of recognition tasks 
and also be very good at chess and other things. So this is another this is a, a way in which the understanding of uh, artificial minds is feeding back. Uh, there's a kind of feedback loop, positive feedback loop between understanding artificial minds and uh, designing better uh, computers and then getting better ideas about how minds work. So all these examples, which uh, we'll be vastly expanding on in the subsequent lectures, uh, emphasize that science is full of positive feedback loops. And specifically, that maybe the most important positive feedback loop that minds can leverage their knowledge of matter and life to make better, that is healthier, longer lived and better equipped minds that can even better leverage their knowledge of matter and life to make even better and to keep going. So that is an introduction to the arrow that connects from what is to what could be. I hope it's whetted your uh, curiosity for uh, deeper discussions to come. Let me now discuss the question of going from what could be to what should be. And here, you was not altogether wrong. <laughs> uh, here, we don't, we don't have a logical, logically compelling arrow. What we do have is an enriched discussion by thinking uh, hard about what could be uh, that can inform the discussion of what should be. And I will uh, again uh, uh, do this uh, in an introductory way here. Uh, this will be treated much more deeply in the fifth lecture. Mm. But uh, what should be? What should be? People have thought about that and uh, also thought about what could be. In thinking about what could be and what should be, uh, you also want to think about what shouldn't be. You have a menu of possibilities and you want to make the good ones, the things that you think are good happen, the things that you think are not good not happen. <clears throat> uh, the first thing to say here is that uh, science has, science and uh, ever since the industrial revolution has led to very, very rapid, exponentially rapid uh, growth in wealth. This is as measured by something called GDP per capita, but that's per, per person. So, uh, but also you'd get very similar uh, estimates by using other measures. And you see that this was static for a very long time, uh, grew very, very slowly until the injection of scientific and rational ideas into uh, technology and life uh, made it take off exponentially with, we'll see, no end in sight. So we can imagine, not can responsibly imagine, we should imagine uh, futures in which there are enormously more, there's enormously more wealth in the world uh, and also health, longevity. This was anticipated. In fact, it was, he was, uh, it was already uh, declared to be victorious in 1928, roughly the same time as Dirac was making his statements about the victory of physics. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was making statements about the victory of productivity. And already in 1928, just before the Great Depression, you'll note, he said, thus for the first time since his creation, Man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy his leisure, which science and compound of interest will have won for him to live wisely 
and agreeably and well. Well, already in 1928, uh, Keynes, who was no fool, thought that uh, the resources that people had produced was enough to ensure a good life in this sense, uh, free of pressing economic cares uh, for everyone. As we know, that hasn't come to pass. Nevertheless, if you renormalize our present standard of what a good life is down to the, the past, it's partly a matter of expectations rising uh, as well as maldistribution of wealth. In any case, Keynes posed the question, what, what do you want? I'll tell you what could be. You, you get to choose what should be. Now, we can Google, do a Google search on utopias. And you get lots of, which is people imagining what a, an ideal world would be. And you get all kinds of things. But if there's a common theme in them, I would say that it's also consistent with history in a sense. Uh, people imagine utopias, which are based on how the upper classes used to live. <laughs> so uh, this is also a great theme of romance novels, for instance. Many are set in the Regency. And when they're set in the Regency, they're not set among the servants or the farmers. They're set about, um, um, uh, by the people who have the wealth. But if everybody has wealth, everybody could live that way. And with uh, modern uh, science of uh, productivity and in the future, uh, AIs that uh, could be functioning as servants, and uh, these, these are realizable. So that's, that's one possibility is to look to the past, to look what people have demonstrated in practice, they actually want so-called revealed preferences uh, as one source of inspiration. On the other hand, in talking about what should be, we also have to recognize that uh, we have to think about what everything that could be uh, and not only work towards the things that are good, but avoid the things that are plausible and very bad. And if you uh, Google utopia, you also get led very quickly to dystopia on the second page. The speaker is muted. Frank, we can't hear you. Now, speaking for myself, uh, speaking about what would be a good future. Uh, first of all, I think one should pose the question honestly. If in the future people are going to be healthier, wealthier, wiser, Frank, we can't hear you clearly. Maybe they should decide.
muted. I hope I haven't. I hope I haven't been muted for long. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, technical glitch. I was muted for a moment. Uh, those of you on the uh, on the Zoom, you are uh, muted on the dystopia slide. Let me just say that uh, the Odd John's attempted put down to say that you are the Archaeopteryx of the spirit. In my opinion, is not a put down. That would be a wonderful thing to be to be uh, someone that tried to fly, tried to do the spirit, tried to do justice to uh, possibilities for uh, doing new things and making possible futures that uh, they couldn't imagine, but uh, were quite glorious. So, and What's, what certainly is true is that if you don't know what you want, you probably will never get it. So knowing, thinking about what could be and then surveying that, seeing what the choices are, is a vital, vital activity in order to get good results. Of course, even if you do know what you want, as the Rolling Stones said, uh, you can't always get what you want. And that brings us to the final arrow, which I'll say only a few words about. Uh, that is the arrow that goes from should be to is. In some sense, that's the most straightforward because you picked from the options of what could be to decide what should be and science then having shown that that's a possibility uh, can help you get there however that's of course a gross simplification of human history and how politics works and so forth much more is involved especially since there can be different opinions about what should be And those questions are certainly not going to be exhausted in, in this lecture series, but I think they are advanced by intelligent discussion of what should be and uh, trying to choose, make intelligent discussions and choices about what is. Now, let me see how I'm doing for time. Oh, fine. Uh, as a kind of coda to this, and maybe a bit of encouragement, I'd like to introduce a subject that will be treated in much more depth in the final lecture, which is the, the amazing, astonishing fact that in science, by following this kind of logic and imagining what should be, we've often been led to figuring out what is. So nature cooperates. You go from, by imagining what should be, in many cases, uh, you find out what is. And I'll show you more cases in the final lecture, but let me, let me just show you one the, uh, that's particularly striking and self-contained. So, Eugene Wigner talked about or uh, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences in a famous essay. And the essence of it is this statement, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift, which we neither understand nor deserve. He was, a strange and remarkable fellow. But he, he lived lived the life, and he, more than anyone, was responsible for beautifying the laws of quantum mechanics by bringing in the ideas of symmetry and the mathematics of group theory, which is very powerful in that domain. But that's not what I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, in the 
19th century, in the early part of the 19th century, as people started to get serious about studying electricity and magnetism, they found various phenomena and codified them in laws. And uh, one of the laws, well, and uh, a useful way to think about the laws, it, it emerged in the uh, conceptual world of, of Michael Faraday, was to uh, postulate that there were fields in, in apparently empty space. They were actually entities that uh, had an existence and a life of their own, electric and magnetic fields, and uh, that you could formulate the laws of these fields in a profound and simple geometric way. And several of the, all the laws that were known at the time when Maxwell came into the picture are summarized here. So this one says that if you have charge, then electric fields come out of it in a more exact way. Uh, this one says that there are no magnetic charges, but if there were magnetic charges that would come out in a similar way. This one says that magnetic fields that change in time lead to electric fields that circulate around them. And this one, so-called Ampere's law, says that if you have a current, it leads to a circulating magnetic field around it. Maxwell looked at these laws and codified them in this way and said, well, first of all, they're not entirely consistent. It turns out that if you put these laws together, uh, they violate another sacred principle of electromagnetism at that time, which is the conservation of electric charge discovered by our own uh, Benjamin Franklin. And furthermore, they're kind of lopsided. They're imbalanced. They're in so they're inconsistent, so they have to be fixed somehow. How do you fix them? You know, well, you can try to fix them by just any old way, and just cockamamie uh, fudging. But Maxwell looked for symmetry and balance. And what he proposed is that this effect, that a magnetic field that changes in time leads to an electric field should be paired with a dual effect that changing electric fields produce magnetic fields. And boom, there it is. This is Maxwell's addition to the laws of electromagnetism. And now you have in pictorial form, but without loss of content, the Maxwell equations, which students of physics study hard and uh, which are the basis of a lot that we know about nature and uh, a lot of technology and engineering. Whoops, that's not the place. The first thing that came out of Maxwell's equations after he added that term inspired by symmetry, balance, and consistency. So in other words, by mathematical beauty of an ideal of what should be, uh, he found that, well, you have changing electric fields producing magnetic fields, which are also changing as the electric fields go along. And the magnetic fields then produce electric fields and it keeps going. So you can have propagating disturbances. Maxwell showed that these just from the laws that these disturbances would propagate at the speed of light and said that that was light. That deserves, I think, a portrait. This was Maxwell a few years later, the ultimate visionary. And this is what he said about it. The vast interplanetary and interstellar regions will no longer be regarded as waste places in the universe, which the creator has not seen fit to fill with the symbols of the manifold order of his kingdom. We shall find them to be already full of this wonderful medium, so full that no human power can remove it from the smallest portion of space or, preserve, or produce the slightest flaw in its infinite continuity. So Maxwell very much uh, thought about the profound meaning of what he had discussed, not only in terms of its technological implications, but what it meant for 
uh, the deepest questions of uh, man, the man of the universe and mankind's place in it. Also, as a result of this, he not only explained known phenomena, not only the known phenomena come from this vision of what should be, but a raft of new kinds of light, not visible, not visible to our eyes, were predicted. And over the course of many decades later, uh, one by one, discovered experimentally. And now we use them, of course, to transmit uh, all kinds of garbage over the radio, uh, to cook, uh, to see at night, and so forth. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite quotations from Heinrich Hertz, who was the first to discover a new kind of light predicted by Maxwell equations, what today we call radio. He said, one cannot escape the feeling that these mathematical formulae have an independent existence and an intelligence of their own, that they are wiser than we, wiser even than their discoverers, that we get more out of them than was originally put into them. So thinking about what should be turns out to be a very fruitful and surprising source of insight into what is. Or again, going to Einstein for the pithiest and most poetic formulation, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. And so in the physical, in the physical world, at least, uh, what should be turns out to be an excellent guide to what is. And maybe that's encouragement for thinking that uh, also in the broader world of humanity's evolution, uh, that thinking about what should be and pointing in the direction of making it is will actually make it happen. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how Malik and I are actually going to manage the in person questions and the Zoom questions, but maybe Anne. Could you keep an eye on the questions coming in on the chat over Zoom? We have quite a few, uh, apparently. Okay. And then I will, we will alternate with questions from the audience. Okay. Maybe we can start with the audience. Well, while, yeah, while, start while, with the audience while we're finding the questions. While we're, while we're, Who would like to start? Yes. Yes. I'll have much more to say about that in subsequent lectures, uh, but I don't know if chat GPT in particular will affect uh, uh, um, physics research, but physics research would already be uh, very, very different and much impoverished if we didn't use powerful assistance from our silicon friends. So for instance, uh, specifically the analysis of big data sets in astronomy that uh, led to things like the discovery of gravitational waves or in particle physics that led to the discovery of the Higgs particle would again be absolutely inconceivable without having tremendously powerful computation. Uh, now, I think the the uh, spirit of your question is a much more high level question, uh, or in the in the language of computer science, a high level language where you converse with the computer instead of having to write elaborate programs. Uh, and we do have semi pretty high level programs that I I use every day. Mathematica is something that. You, it's, it's not quite you talk to the computer and it tells you, but that the instructions are very, very simple. It's not, it's not standard computer programming. And that will happen more and more. And eventually uh, the computers will be assistants. And then 
quite possibly, as we found in chess, uh, they will get better at it than, than humans are. But that seems a long way off because the questions are kind of hazier. Uh, and chess is very well formulated in games. Uh, but, well, I'll discuss it more uh, in, in future lectures. But it's a very good question. And I think, uh, I think we are Archaeopteryx. We are the Archaeopteryx of physics. <laughs> physics. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me read one question uh, from, from Tana um, Kulin. So he said, great presentation, mm -hmm. um, good start. <laughs> what you, do you think the role of philosophy plays in going to what should be and ultimately to is? Thank you. Well, the weakest link in this threefold way is certainly the link from could be to should be. How do you make those choices? Mm -hmm. uh, and history and philosophy have helpful things to say about that, I think. Uh, people have been trying to imagine different uh, futures for a long time, not with the kind of realism and power that we ha now can do it because we know very much what's possible. We, we have much better ideas of what's possible and not, not only possible, but realistic uh, in the uh, both the reasonably near-term and the long-term future. Um, so, I mean, for instance, let's be concrete here. Uh, you can, probably the most famous, the original utopia is Plato's Republic. And if you look at Plato's Republic, it's pathetic. Okay. The whole point of it was to have a city state containing a few thousand people that was a powerful military, you know, could, which meant that it could beat other city states of similar size. <laughs> That's you know, nowadays that's we've gone way, way, way beyond that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think I really do think we're on our own. Although we can, we can commune, we can commune to advantage with great minds of the past. I think the landscape around us today is so different that that's a limited resource. Okay, so I'm going to take another question from the audience. So I'm going to ask Frank, can you repeat the question when we take yes. it to the okay. Like that? Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the question is uh, does mind include consciousness or is it necessarily or uh is that uh i'm very uncomfortable with discussions of consciousness i know they're very popular uh however i'd like to bring it down to earth in terms of uh, uh what conscious consciousness at some level is self-awareness and self-awareness is something that you can certainly program you can have a computer look into look into its own functioning and adjust uh, according to that. The problem with consciousness is that it's so vague that uh, the, the, the discussions, well, there are voluminous discussions on it and you read these discussions and at the end, you don't know much more than when you began. <laughs> uh, I, but, but we are understanding how mind works and how specifically human minds work. Uh, I'll be talking about that in some depth. And I think as we do, the problem of consciousness will uh, dissolve. We'll understand how at a molecular level, minds work, what, what their self-awareness consists of at a molecular level. And then we'll say, oh yes, that does correspond very well to the thing I uh, perceive as consciousness. I could be wrong about that. It's not a settled question at present, but that's that's what I think. 
and I'm not alone in that. Uh, I'll be leaning quite a bit on a big authority figure, <laughs> uh, Francis Crick, who uh, is famous as the discoverer of GN DNA structure, but also made many other fundamental contributions to molecular biology. And for many years towards the end of his career, got interested in the brain and how it works. He sort of turned from molecular biology of heredity to neurobiology. And he formulated something he called the astonishing hypothesis, which I don't know if it's astonishing. Well, it is astonishing if you think back about it, but it would also be astonishing if it were wrong. His astonishing hypothesis is that basically mind emerges from matter, that, that there's nothing else, okay? That, that, that uh, you, you can fully understand how um, human brains work and, and the actions they produce and the act behaviors in terms of uh, action of matter and molecules. If that's wrong, it would be very, very interesting. But so far, uh, the there's no evidence that it's wrong. And people in neurobiology have done all kinds of sensitive experiments and never found an, uh, an exception. And if it's correct, then consciousness just has to be an emergent property of lots of complicated molecules working together. Um, and uh, we, you saw how a cat's hippocampus is already a hint of how complicated, but only the merest hint of how complicated it is that we're dealing, uh, the substance is that we're dealing with and how structured. So it's not absurd to think that uh, it's hard to understand <laughs> and, and uh, some of its manifestations like consciousness are hard to understand. Uh, and also uh, another source of insight, I think, is coming precisely from things like chat BT, GPT that uh, was mentioned, this uh, um, modern program that you can, you can converse with. You type in all kinds of, any kind of conversation and it has a conversation with you, some of which can get quite weird, but they do, <laughs> it, it passes the Turing, the so-called Turing test with flying colors. Namely, it would be very difficult to tell uh, with a small number of questions, whether you're talking to a human being or this, this uh, computer program. And uh, so is it consciousness? How, is it conscious? I, uh, I don't, not yet, but I think uh, these sorts of things are getting close. And one day a computer, you'll ask a computer, are you conscious? And it will say, yes, I am. And how could you, how could you even ask? I've been your friend for 20 years. <laughs> We've gone through so much together. Uh, of course I'm conscious. And I think it would be very uncomfortable to say, no, you're not, because you're made of silicon and not carbon, right? That's, that's, uh, okay, so another question yes. from online, and I'm gonna uh, take some new speakers and give everybody a chance to ask questions. Um, so if I think I understand Peter Bennett's question, okay. one might associate should be with theory, for example, Maxwell. <laughs> but great theory is guided, constrained by nature. Can you speak to the synergy of theory and experiment? Well, uh, as I said, the theory does. Uh, okay, so that arrow from should be to is, it's amazing that it, it works as well as it does in, in some cases, but there have also been spectacular failures. Okay, many of us were expecting, I mean, for instance, supersymmetry to be discovered at the LHC, and it wasn't. We expected proton decay to be observed, and it wasn't. We had very beautiful reasons to think so, but uh, so far, it had at least so far, it has they haven't uh, come to fruition. Uh, and other, there were other beautiful ideas like the steady state universe, very, very symmetric, of course, uh, that uh, also didn't didn't pan out. So it's not a, it's it can be wrong, and it's part of the science. Part of science is to check whether your beautiful ideas actually pan out, and 
And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And that's it, whether you like it or not, right? Uh, that's, uh, on the other hand, uh, um, uh, experiment uh, by especially reinforcing the, the arrow, the link that goes from what is to what could be, how empowers, empowers this positive feedback loop. And so uh, it's only by knowing what could be that you can imagine from experiment that you can imagine what should be and then try to suggest, uh, or then you'll find out whether it's true. So, so the whole dynamic of theory and experiment, I think is a beautiful illustration of the threefold thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Another question from the audience? Yes. yes. Oh, so the question is, I'm not sure exactly what the question is. The question is uh, <laughs> whether, whether we can develop uh, method, I think, let me try it, uh, we, w whether we can develop uh, methods of, of generating energy that do not endanger the climate, do not threaten to, to or poison the atmosphere and threaten to change climate in uncontrollable ways. And the answer, which I already hinted at, is definitely yes, and in fact, it's happening. Uh, the development of photovoltaics, which do not rely on burning the sun's energy that was stored in plants millions of years ago, but rather directly use the sun's energy uh, and convert it into usable forms. It now is economically competitive already with, uh, with fossil fuels and doesn't lead to those problems. Uh, there's a more far-fetched possibility that uh, fusion will uh, be possible. So making making little suns here on Earth uh, that that use the power of uh, nuclear conversions. There's another form of nuclear conversion, so-called fission reactors, which uh, also produce at least different kinds of problems <laughs> than uh, than uh, than fossil fuels. And uh, they have a very mixed reputation because of, uh, they lead to radioactive. Pro they can lead to radioactive products. They also also can lead to. They also have some catastrophic failure modes. Uh, but uh, actually, if you take an objective look, they they seem to be pretty attractive as at least a short term stopgap or supplying some of the energy that we'd like to uh, not be, so that we need and use and want uh, that wouldn't re rely on burning fossil fuels. Okay, so question from Joe Manor, mm. um, long one. So on the unreasonable, <laughs> on, on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, it seems like it's not that unreasonable that math <laughs> describes our universe when you consider that humans develop math. <laughs> Couldn't any universe that follows consistent laws uh, not be described by some mathematical system? Okay, so the question is, uh, okay, if you, if you codify the behavior of what you see uh, and capture it in equations, uh, then is that unreasonable? And that, of course, is not unreasonable if you <laughs> codify what you see, and uh, then uh, then you codify what you've seen. However, what is unreasonable, I think, what what Vigner was referring to, is that the laws turn out to be so simple. Uh, now, simple is used in a, sp a special sense here. Uh, to understand these simple laws properly, you have to go to graduate school in physics and work pretty hard. Uh, and to understand how they apply to the physical world, you have to work even harder <laughs> at solving them. Uh, but uh, an objective measure of it is that you can 
teach without loss these laws to a computer, put them into a rather short computer program, much shorter in principle, not in principle, much shorter than, than any modern operating system or a program like Word, and that's the world. So you can capture it. So it doesn't have to be that way. It could have been that as you discovered more and more phenomena, you just have to make more and more entries uh, and that, uh, but, but it doesn't turn out to be that way. You, you, can, you can get a very, very compact description and that's the non-trivial, as we say, part of the statement that, uh, that the, the, the uh, mathematical, the success of the mathematics is unreasonable. Okay, it wasn't, it, there's, you get, much, or another way of putting it is what Hertz said, you get much more out than you put in. That's, that's the, yeah, that's the answer I wish I had given. <laughs> you, you can, uh, you get much more out than you put in. And that's uh, fine. Whereas, for instance, if if you if we lived in some if we lived in a computer simulation like some of the Matrix people, uh, like in the Matrix movies or some apparently popular in Silicon Valley, in certain circles, uh, then it wouldn't necessarily be true that you could capture it in a in a in a, uh, in a short program. The program could be arbitrary, could be very complicated, and all kinds of things might happen. The program for say Super Mario World is much bigger than the program I was talking about that describes the actual world, if you let it long, <laughs> run long enough. Uh, and the uh, and it does it can't be boiled down. It's just a, a program that was sort of at the whim of, of the programmer. Uh, so our world doesn't look like that. Our world is, has a lot of complexity emerging from deep simplicity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So my, yeah, <laughs> the three. Uh, well, the, the statement was that the threefold way makes a distinction between life and mind. That's not really the intent. The the threefold way is about this going from is to could be to should be and back. Uh, the uh, discussion of going from is to could be, I divided for convenience, I will, I have divided, and we, you'll see, <laughs> into three categories for convenience of uh, matter, life, and mind. But as you'll see, there are all kinds of cross connections and uh, that that are that's just for convenience. Uh, so so no, there's no profound. I don't think. And and nowadays the borders between biology and and uh, uh, physics and math and computer science are all very porous. And people go back. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jonas Halsworm. Thank you for the presentation. Hmm. Are there any current beautiful um, theories or natural theories? that you would be most disappointed to have proven false. Oh, yes. Well, axions. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well to say they're hypothetical gravitons, right? Well, I mean, gravitons are not really hypothetical in the sense that uh, they are the quanta of a gravitation of the gravitational field, which is anything but hypothetical. I mean, it's the, it's the original phenomena that was discovered in modern physics. Uh, and gravitational waves now have been discovered, which we can only understand as being big collections of gravitons. However, uh, individual gravitons are predicted to interact very, very weakly with ordinary matter, and the prospects for seeing them are individual, the effects of the discreteness of gravitons, the quantum nature of gravitons, are somewhat remote uh at least no one's come up with a really convincing idea i would say although i i have some of the best ideas about that but not <laughs> uh it hasn't it hasn't yet become experimental reality uh the uh the magnetic monopole again theoretically 
uh, is a consequence, is, is, was originally postulated by Dirac on the basis of mathematical beauty and symmetry, kind of going one step beyond Maxwell to make full symmetry between electric and magnetic fields to the extent possible within quantum mechanics. Uh, when Dirac uh, first came up with that idea, it was a pure creation of mind and a, 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 an extrapolation of what he thought from should be that might have been what is, but uh, what later understanding led to is the more refined understanding of how to get magnetic monopoles. And according to that refi more refined understanding, as we understand, understood more about all the interactions and how they worked, we uh, predict with fairly high confidence that magnetic monopoles are meant are do exist, but they're very, very heavy and much, much too heavy to be produced in laboratories or even in the early universe. So sorry. So they exist, but they exist in kind of theory world, but not uh, in um, in ex in experiment at present. Uh, what was the other one? Axions. Well, axions are predicted to be very difficult to uh, observe, except as dark matter uh, uh, filling the universe. So both parts of that prediction have been verified. They there is dark matter in the universe, and uh, axions are very difficult to observe, but we, we are hoping uh, we have very concrete ideas for how you might actually observe it. And that's, that's an exciting frontier of modern physics that hundreds of research physicists are trying to make a reality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Question from here, yeah. yeah. What, I'm sorry, say that again? The question was, should researchers today strive for beauty and elegance in their equations? Yes, in their work, more generally, not just equations, but also even in the design of experiments. Okay, you, you, when the, when it's, when it's done well, it's sort of you use the you use the available resources in an economical way. You streamline it. You do it in a really incisive, intelligent way, so as to optimize things. They tend to have a kind of intellectual and sometimes a physical beauty that uh, is very inspiring. But um, so, in some parts of physics, it's all we have to go on when we uh, or. So when the experiments become very, very difficult, you have to use your imagination. And when you use your imagination, uh, it's almost inevitable that you're guided by aesthetic principles. And so that's, that's, yeah. so okay. very much so. So you couldn't, you shouldn't, you certainly shouldn't turn away from beauty, <laughs> demand, uh, demand that your equations be ugly for heaven's sake. No, no. <laughs> I say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So what you see is a beautiful experiment might, might vary. <laughs> it can vary, but you know it when you see it, I yeah, think. Yeah. Um, so the question from Mal is very similar to one that was asked earlier. Uh, there are many instances in which science and technology has charged forward regardless of the ethical implications. Yes nuclear weapons, cloning, genetic engineering, AI. In practice, do you think it is possible to prevent futures that we could realize that may not be desirable? And there was an earlier question about how we choose, if we have a choice of futures, yes. we actually choose in a smart way, right? Yes, well, that's one of the, the when you say we, I guess that's the, the, net, the essence yeah. of the question, who yeah. is we <laughs> and how, how do you uh, adjudicate different visions of what should be. Uh, and that's a question I'm not prepared to answer. <laughs> uh, I'll be content to uh, make, the make the discussion more intelligent by spelling out what could be. And uh, I think, I, I would hope that if you had clear visions of what could be mm -hmm. there could be wide agreement about 
what should be. Now, maybe there's not a unique utopia. Some people would want to go back to the Regency. Other people would want to go back to ancient Greece. Maybe other people would, would like to live in virtual realities or, you know, uh, would dance in the forest, whatever. I mean, there are many, many possibilities Or other people would like to uh, become super minds and, and understand things more deeply. And uh, there's no reason why it has to be one or the other. Uh, we could imagine all those things happening. Uh, so my own hope is that uh, whatever the process is by which people will move from what could be to what should be, that they not demand a unique answer. I think that's really, really dangerous when people think they have the only answer to how things should be. That's what leads to you know, unfortunate consequences that uh, we we know from history. Yeah. A little louder, please. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the question here is uh, uh, a hard scientific question, if I understand correctly, whether uh, experimenters in in uh, high, in fundamental physics need. Uh, more ideas from theory or better machines? And the answer is, we don't know for sure where the next big discoveries are going to come from, and uh, both now. So both, both are sources of inspiration. And um, so uh, one, the, how should I say, the better machines is kind of the brute force approach. You bang things together at higher and higher energies, for instance or you make more and more sensitive measurements and you hope that something new will turn up. Uh, but uh, the other way is if you have theoretical insight that can guide experiments. And for instance, in the search for axioms, that's very much the case because we can be very specific about what kinds of measurements you have to make in order to either rule in or rule out that hypothesis. And, it suggests experiments that otherwise you would never perform. Yeah, I mean, I, as an experimentalist who's looked with supersymmetry, I have to say that's a very beautiful theory that, you know, is, is less and less likely that it would accelerate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think going up in energy of the accelerator is going to make much difference anymore. I mean, well, maybe, but, yeah. It's a very expensive props, prospect. Yeah. So, yeah, unless. So it's a hard sell. Yes. In the room to thank Frank, and I'm sure this is going to be a great series of 